It's obvious that just about everybody knows the Super Mario series. It really doesn't need an introduction. It's full of iconic characters and some of the best games I've ever played. But the Mario series has changed in obviously a lot of ways, but also in ways due to creative control, heated arguments, and behind the scenes tension. So how has the Mario series exactly changed from entry to entry, and who's responsible for bringing in these new ideas or even taking them away? Mario was first introduced in the 1981 arcade game Donkey Kong. Created by Shigeru Miyamoto, this was his first project as a video game designer. Now Donkey Kong was different from other arcade games because of its prioritization of unique characters, cutscenes, and a plot as a means of motivation for the player. By today's standards, Donkey Kong is quite simple, but one thing held true that so many other games failed to understand. The game had to be an experience that resonated with the player, and thankfully, Donkey Kong did that. Donkey Kong took around five months to complete and became a hit in Japan and North America where it became the highest grossing arcade game between 1981 and 1982. Fast forward about 13 years where Mario is now for the first time being fully realized in 3D with the production of Super Mario 64 beginning with a unique concept of jumping into magical paintings to recover power stars in order to save Princess Peach from Bowser. This foundation of saving Peach from Bowser would be the formula for Mario games for years to come. After nearly three years of development, Super Mario 64 was released in 1996 in Japan and North America and quickly received critical acclaim and became the best-selling game for six years straight. Super Mario 64 somehow excelled over everything that the previous Mario games have done before it and created a whole new standard for gaming as a whole. Okay, but I think everyone knows about Mario 64 Ningani. I know, I know, but uh, hear me out. Th I'm setting the groundwork, okay? This, this is my video. Because this is where Mario starts changing and people don't even realize. With Super Mario 64 becoming the best-selling game of all time on the Nintendo 64, creating a Mario sequel was a daunting task. How do you follow up on creating one of the best and most innovative games of its time? With the Nintendo GameCube being Nintendo's next home console, the Mario sequel was able to be more graphically impressive than ever. So who would be in charge of directing this game? Enter Yoshiaki Koizumi, assistant director for Mario 64. This would be his first time as the one in charge. The interesting thing is that Koizumi actually wanted to be a film director. He got a start at Nintendo with the sole purpose to do one thing, to create a world, characters, and story. Koizumi saw video games as a unique medium to create a drama and tension. And this is where the next game in the Super Mario series, Super Mario Sunshine, really differentiates itself from anything before. The team was ready for something new and fresh. And while Sunshine still followed that Mario formula, a main hub area, recovering power stars, shine sprites in this case, and jumping into various levels, it's the differences that make Sunshine so interesting. Super Mario Sunshine was the first Mario game to feature voice character dialogue and a story. The voice acting in Sunshine was like really cringe though. Look, it was charming, okay? This appears to be quite a predicament, Mario. Data analysis verifies that the- Look, I said charming, not good. Instead of Mario recovering stars to save Princess Peach right off the bat, he first goes to jail being framed for being the suspect to put graffiti all over Isle Delfino. So in order to clear his name, he has to clean up the island. And that was the objective. It's technically as far as the team needed to go for the player to have an incentive. But that's where Mario Sunshine's story begins. Soon after you get familiar with the situation, Princess Peach gets kidnapped by the one who has actually been terrorizing Isle Delfino, Shadow Mario, who we soon learn is actually Bowser's son, Bowser Jr. And after an intense boss battle, Bowser Jr. tells us that Princess Peach is his mother and Mario is actually a bad man trying to take her from him. Bowser Jr. escapes and is into the final boss battle where you save Peach from Bowser and his son that Bowser comes clean to his son and reveals to him that Peach isn't his mother. The story of Mario Sunshine is one thing, but also, unlike Mario 64, every place that Mario jumped into was actually a real place. Everything in Mario Sunshine took place on Isle Delfino, and were quickly introduced to the various places on the island. Bianco Hills, Rico Harbor, Gelato Beach, and the list goes on. And unlike Mario 64, there are no random floating objects for platforming. Everything has a reason to be there. The platforms on Bianco Hills are connected to a windmill so it would make sense that they're rotating. Pina Park is an amusement park, so it makes sense there are a lot of moving objects for Mario to run and jump on. Even in the background of various levels, we can see the other places in the game to show that it's all connected. What made Super Mario Sunshine so unique is its fully realized world. It's all incredibly cohesive. Super Mario Sunshine was released in 2002, and while being praised for its new creative ideas and fresh gameplay, it did get criticized for its seemingly rushed development. Which, let's be real, if you played the final level in Sunshine, you'll agree that this level was literally the dumbest way to lead up to a boss fight. And while some people did enjoy the story elements in Sunshine, other people did not. Unfortunately, even with this being one of the best selling
selling GameCube games, Mario Sunshine sales underperformed, which I don't know how 5 million copies being sold is underperforming. Just sounds like Nintendo needs to be more grateful, am I right? You can tell you know nothing about business. So with Mario Sunshine bringing all these new ideas to the table once again, setting another new standard for the Mario series, how would Mario evolve? Shigeru Miyamoto recommended the concept of Mario being able to jump between spherical-based platforms, an idea he's had even before Sunshine's development. And this was the beginning of Super Mario Galaxy. Mario Galaxy's story starts off fairly simple, with Mario visiting the Mushroom Kingdom with a star festival taking place, an event that only happens once every 100 years only for Bowser to attack the Mushroom Kingdom, with cannons being fired, toads getting frozen, and Mario rushing to the castle to help Princess Peach. Bowser not only kidnaps Peach, but takes the entire castle with him. With Mario barely making it to the castle in time, one of Bowser's minions, Kamek, shoots Mario off the castle grounds, launching him into space. The stakes were higher than ever for a Mario game, and this was the first time we've seen Bowser truly seem terrifying. This intro, as well as the story as a whole, was from the mind of Yoshiaki Koizumi, being the director once again. Super Mario Galaxy had bigger ambitions than ever before in a Mario game, and just like previous entries, Galaxy would have a hub world that would allow you to access the game's levels. It's at this hub area, the Comet Observatory, where you properly meet Rosalina, who's the mother of the Lumas. And it's here where we, the player, for the first time have the opportunity to learn more about Rosalina. If you walk into the library on the Comet Observatory, you can listen to Rosalina's backstory through a children's picture book. And this is where we learn about Rosalina's sorrowful backstory, about her mother dying and her finding a new family being the Lumas. For a Mario game, this was a first, an emotional backstory about one of the characters, and where death for the first time was real in a Mario game. Even though Rosalina's backstory had no correlation to the plot of the game, the inclusion was something that became a fan favorite, giving a character a more meaningful connection to the players. In terms of gameplay, Galaxy evolves on the concepts of both Super Mario 64 and Sunshine. Similar to Mario 64, you have a wide variety of more abstract levels that all uniquely take advantage of Mario's moveset. And similar to Mario Sunshine, there's that sense of cohesion between everything. It's Mario Galaxy's theming that makes this game so effective. Between the music, cinematics, and Rosalina's story, it's the first Mario game that has effectively pulled off this incredibly grand feeling. Super Mario Galaxy was released in 2007 for the Wii, receiving critical acclaim and eventually being hailed as one of the greatest video games of all time. Aside from Mario Teaches Typing, of course, the game where you learn how to type and Toad looks like this for some reason. Hey guys, real quick, I wanna mention that I have a Patreon now. It's easily the best way to support me and you'll get exclusive behind the scenes footage, Discord perks, tutorials, and more. So please consider supporting me. I have a lot of exciting content planned for Patreon. If you wanna get hip, just click the link in the description. If not, totally cool. Subscribing would also mean a ton. But anyway, let's get back to the video. So with Mario currently at its best, it seemed like nothing was going wrong. But behind the scenes, this is where things started changing. After the release of Super Mario Galaxy, the team was ready to move on and quite exhausted from Mario Galaxy's development, with them feeling like they've used all their best ideas to make Galaxy what it is, until Shigeru Miyamoto recommended the team to work on a direct sequel of Galaxy. Thankfully, the team had enough leftover ideas and new ideas to make this sequel happen, and just like Galaxy 1, Super Mario Galaxy 2 went on to receive critical acclaim with incredible gameplay, visuals, level design, and music. Super Mario Galaxy 2 improved on everything that the previous entry set the groundwork for. Except one thing. When you boot up Galaxy 2 for the first time, the story starts off with Mario visiting the Mushroom Kingdom with the Star Festival taking place, an event that only happens once every 100 years. Only for Bowser to attack the Mushroom Kingdom, and then you realize this is the same exact story as Mario Galaxy 1. But why? Mario Sunshine introduced a more complex story than the standard Save the Princess plot. We were introduced to a new character, Bowser Jr., who had his own motives. With full-fledged cutscenes and a cohesive world being Isle Dofino, this was the first Mario game that had this level of depth. And Mario Galaxy 1 expanded upon those ideas. We were once introduced to a new character, Rosalina, who not only had motives, but an emotional backstory. Mario Galaxy 1's theming and sense of connectedness is what made that game so impactful. So why did the evolution of this story-infused gameplay come to a stop? Why was Galaxy 2 more so a reimagining of Galaxy 1 than a true sequel? Well, that's because Miyamoto cut Galaxy 2's story. Yeah, but Galaxy 2 has Yoshi. I know, I know it has Yoshi, but that's not the point. 
Behind the scenes of the production of the Mario game since Mario 64, there have been two people spearheading the creative direction of the Super Mario series, Shigeru Miyamoto, the creator of Mario, and Yoshiaki Koizumi, the director of Sunshine and Galaxy. But behind every bit of Mario's story, new characters, and world cohesion was from the mind of Koizumi. Koizumi has been the creative mind behind all of this, and for the first time since Sunshine, Koizumi was forbidden from giving the new Mario games a strong narrative. For Koizumi, this was frustrating, with Miyamoto having the opposite perspective as Koizumi when it came to storytelling in Mario games, Koizumi found himself trying to sneak bits of story elements into these games. But Galaxy 2 is where Miyamoto halted everything. Fast forward 3 years later to 2013 with the release of Super Mario 3D World, the first 3D home console Mario game since Galaxy 2. Super Mario 3D World's story starts with Mario, Luigi, Peach, and Toad going on a walk until they come across a clear pipe which Mario and Luigi fix. A green fairy-like creature comes out of the pipe, known as the Sprixy Princess, to only then be captured by Bowser, where then Mario, Luigi, Peach, and Toad jump in the pipe to stop Bowser from his evil doing. And that's the entirety of the intro, and essentially, the story in 3D World. And while Super Mario 3D World quickly received critical acclaim, to realize what was lost, we have to take a look at the key differences between this game and the previous entries. Mario Sunshine and Mario Galaxy were both solely directed by Yoshiaki Koizumi and had some critical elements that made them so special. First was the introduction of new mainstay characters. Bowser Jr's first appearance was in Super Mario Sunshine, being the iconic son of Bowser, with him staying as a canonical character. And the same goes for Rosalina, with her first appearance being in, of course, Super Mario Galaxy. These two characters were created with the intention to stay as a unique part of the Mario universe. Compare that to the Sprixies in 3D World, where there is a clear difference in design intention. In matter of fact, the Sprixies were only created due to Princess Peach being a playable character this time around, instead of the damsel in distress. And second was the world building and cohesion. In Super Mario Sunshine, Isle Dofino had an amusement park, hotel, beach, and village, along with new species being introduced, the Piantas and the Nokis. Aldofino was created as a fully realized world in the Mario universe. Similarly, Mario Galaxy had the Comet Observatory, with space being so vast and abstract that moments of familiarity were found here. A bed, a fountain, and a kitchen all helped create that sense of realness. Even the small details, like Bowser Jr.'s paintbrush and Mario's flood both being designed by Professor Egad, the old scientist that Luigi meets in Luigi's Mansion, help create that sense of cohesion that has been lost with the new Super Mario entries, even as going as far as to erase those details in the newer entries. And while the new games are of amazing quality, continuously being critically acclaimed, what hurts is something being given to us only to be taken away. Miyamoto has stated that he's always felt that Mario games themselves aren't particularly suited to having a very heavy story and it was through years of tension and difference in design philosophy between Koizumi and Miyamoto that brought us here today. And it wasn't until 2010, after the release of Super Mario Galaxy 2, where we learned because of this built up tension and creative differences between Koizumi and Miyamoto, that they finally sat down and talked about everything. It was a five hour conversation between the two and their fundamental values about creating a Mario game where they finally came to an understanding with one another. And in this conversation, Miyamoto realized that whether it's story or movies, it's not about whether we need them or don't need them. What's important is that the game resonates. Look, story and Mario games have been on a slippery slope since the beginning. On one hand, having a story in these games have created some of the most memorable characters, worlds, and cohesive elements ever seen in a Mario game. And with the refusal of story even going to the extreme, such as the refusal of original characters in the new Paper Mario games, a spin-off series that was made to have original story and characters, it does seem excessive. But on the other hand, Mario is Miyamoto's creation, and a lot of players are not a fan of these elements in their Mario games, since Mario's sole purpose is to be a platformer game. And it's today with Mario's new games such as Super Mario Odyssey where we're at a compromise. While storytelling has become minimal in the Mario series, we've gotten some of the best experiences in gameplay and new ideas. Ultimately, the intention of a Mario game is to be a game for everybody and an incredibly fun platformer. And that's where we're at today with the Mario series. And I'll be honest, it, it, it kind of hurts me. I miss stories in my Mario games, as lame as that sounds. But I mean, come on though. Yeah, I just skipped the cutscenes. See, see, why did why did you say that? What what do you have to gain from stating? That? Anyway, I don't want this to be about my personal preferences of what make a Mario game good, but to just appreciate Mario Sunshine and Galaxy for what they were and what they brought, and still respect and enjoy the new games that come out. But regardless of all that, ultimately, what matters for a Mario game or any game 
is to just be a game that resonates with the player. Thanks for watching.